forward with the next session that is round table discussion we have our moderator today shri kartik shrita and we have speakers shri josefa korekwala ceo okat foundation swami sadyuchita director international affairs art of living ms usman nahid executive director ikra foundation reverend dr jos nandikara director the center for the study of world religions dr sonal ambani founder world peace 2040 mr priyanka process consultants sri lanka professor fethi mansuri deccan university melbourne australia shri kartik shrita the moderator is currently a director chief operating officer at okat foundation he is also a committee member at higher education forum and principal consultant india and middle east at qs asia quackerly simons private limited his expertise is in education management retail and it in professional multicultural environments designing and implementing sops creating global partnerships branding and marketing and setting up new business ventures profit centers may i request mr karthik to moderate the session thank you a very good morning to all the members on the dais of the dais revered guests friends students and uh, citizens of this lovely place called kerala trivandrum i'll keep the moderation as short as possible shorter than the introduction that was given about me and uh, enable our revered guests on the dais today uh, the format of the discussion for the benefit of everybody each one of the panel members here would go up on the dais and make a presentation and uh, once everybody is done we then leave the floor open for uh, discussions we are close to noon it's a little difficult to have a session at this point of time everybody is hungry but we'll try and keep it as entertaining as possible we need your support a lot of questions from your side will keep us all awake at the site so let's go ahead the first speaker for this noon is uh, shri josefa korakiwala Josefa's current positions are as the CEO of Vocard Foundation and the executive director of Vocard Limited. He is the main inspiration behind the Vocard Foundation movement, an MBA from Yale University and a Bachelor of Commerce from the Mumbai University. He has been awarded the Outstanding National Citizen Awards by the National Citizens Guild 2009 and the Who's Who Social Entrepreneur of the Year Award in 2009 again. He speaks internationally on topics of leadership human values social business and corporate social responsibility may i now welcome shri korakiwala to start this noon with his presentation please uh, good morning everybody it's my pleasure to be here in trivandrum and to talk on my favorite topic which is human values and the uh, topic i have chosen today is uh, the role of human values for world peace and the topic of world peace is a very important topic and uh, what i'll try to say is what is the role of human values in this if you can so this is a slide which i will talk for 2 minutes because i guess i have 2 minutes so here the bottom part of the slide is uh, what we call is peace with oneself and uh, this is what the inner peace and tranquility and happiness this is a triangle and this is the bottom part of the slide it's called the peace with oneself it's the foundation so when a person has peace with oneself then he is at a inner peace then it is possible to move upper in the triangle and then he can have peace amongst people uh once he has peace with himself he can go above in the triangle and he can then start having peace amongst the other fellow human beings he is living with and then when he has peace amongst the fellow human beings he is living with it creates something called peace amongst nations and when you have peace amongst nations that's the concept of world peace so the point here to note is that as a 
uh, Guruji, uh, Shishi Ravi Shankar says that human values is the foundation of all peace. And the way uh, you achieve peace with oneself is through human values. And uh, uh, it does not matter which religion you are following or which God you are following. Uh, the seven human values which we follow, uh, we'll just go next, 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 next. Okay, so these are the seven human values. And these seven human values, they correspond to one day of the week. And through the practice of these human values, where there's a lot of research and concepts which we have, and I have a book on that, uh, uh, seven human values, uh, they are called gratitude, forgiveness, love, humility, giving, patience, and truth. So through the practice of gratitude and thankfulness, through forgiveness, uh, today is a World Forgiveness Day, which Wokhart Foundation has celebrated on February 7th. And uh, 25,000 ribbons have been tied among the college students where we have inspiration clubs. The third human value is love, which is celebrated on Wednesday. The fourth is humility, giving, patience, and truth. And these seven human values, through an understanding and practice of it, it leads to a greater inner peace and tranquility. And this is the foundation of world peace. So this is my simple basic hypothesis and uh, though my presentation is half an hour, but I have only three minutes. So this is what I wanted to put across to you. Thank you. Thank you, Shri Kurakiwalaji. We'll have a lot of time uh, in discussions. So we'll give an open, a lot of opportunities for people to ask you questions and then you can go ahead and answer them. Uh, next, we're very happy to have uh, Shri Swami Sadhyo Jataji. He was born in the royal family of Kerala. Finished his B.Tech in Mechanical Engineering, Swamiji coordinates the international activities of the very popular Art of Living Foundation. Most importantly, he is actively involved in the relief process initiated by His Holiness Sri Sri Ravi Shankar Ji in Sri Lanka. Please welcome him on the dais. Mannatha Shri Jagannatha Madguru Shri Jagadguru Madatma Sarvabhutatma Tasmai Shri Gurave Namah Om Shanti 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 <coughs> Good afternoon and Namaste. <clears throat> we said peace three times. In fact, my previous speaker, he already mentioned about this. Peace within oneself, peace in the society, and peace with the universe. <clears throat> so for the past two days, you have listened to many talks about unity and diversity, and today, there was difference of opinion whether it should be unity or whether it should be harmony. You know, wise people, wise men celebrate the diversity. And the fools create conflicts out of diversity. So what is most important now is to make more and more and more people wise. Because the whole world is one family. It is Vasudeva Kutumbaka. Those who do not exhibit peace, those who do not feel love for humanity, they are not religious at all. They have moved away from the religion. See, unity in religion is not possible because it's already one. How can we have unity when it is already one? We have to just realize that, that's all. And spirit loves diversity. That's why we have different types of fruits, different types of vegetables, different types of people. Honoring diversity is the only way we can be at peace. And what is this root cause of these conflicts? The main root cause is just stress. 
people don't know how to handle their mind how to hand you know we have been conducting art of link foundation we have been conducting courses in the prisons all over the world when we talk to the even the hardcore criminal they say you know i did not do this that moment i did not know how to handle my emotion and it just happened so what is most important is to educate people to handle their mind just knowledge is not import uh, is not enough we can talk about this we can talk about peace we can talk about love all these beautiful qualities but along with that what is most important is some technique to sustain to practice so knowledge coupled with practice that is the uh, that can bring the result that we are looking for and what are the solutions one is reeducate our children our youth in peace and second is we have to globalize wisdom we have globalized potato chips we have globalized coca cola we have globalized everything except wisdom so every child should know about all other religions just little bit about other religions then you know this fundamentalism fanaticism and eventually terrorism we can put an end to it and as my master his holiness shri shri ravishankar ji says deepen your roots and broaden your vision you be very deep in whatever you are at the same time we have to have a broad vision and these forums are very important and i'm sure we will not just stop this here this will continue because dialogue is a sign of civilization and more and more and more forums at the same time along with that some uh, very important action plans to whatever we have been discussing here we have to put that in practice and i wish all the best and art of link foundation is always with uh, all of you to support and to lead all these projects thank you swami ji for leaving us with a very powerful line of dialogue a sign of civilization next we have reverend dr jos nandikara an associate professor at the faculty of philosophy at dharmaram vidya kshetram and at the department of philosophy christ university bangalore he is also the director of the center for the study of world religions and the chief editor of the journal of dharma he holds a phd in philosophy from the warwick university uk his doctoral dissertation was titled being human from a religious point of view we welcome you sir dear sisters and brothers namaste i would like to talk on the dynamics of dharmaram dialogue which we live train and celebrate the medieval definition for theology is fides querens intellectum faith seeking understanding at dharmaram we modified it as faith seeking harmony of life we have on the please next slide we have jesus as the sanatana guru sitting under the bodhi tree through prayer and meditation becoming the guru showing the world the way of love we follow the ever old and ever new wisdom of the three h formation by the way next slide please dharmaram the word means aramam of dharma garden of dharma the catholic priesthood training is the longest in any other profession it takes 10 to 15 years and we train and form ourselves by experience that of the heart prayer and meditation and through intellectual pursuit all of us are at least triple graduates one in a philosophy the other in theology and in a secular subject thirdly we join together in action action for justice and development un has set four goals for knowledge education learning to know learning to do learning to live together in harmony and learning to be 
So I suggest our Dharmara model is a model for, for India and for the globe. There are three characteristics. One, plurality of cultures. Therefore, one response to that is inculturation. Secondly, a plurality of religions, dialogue as the key to humanity. Thirdly, there is mass poverty. We need to come together with our hands, action for justice and development. And the priests are not trained for less than 2% Catholics or Christians, but for the whole of India and for the whole world. Next slide, please. We have a mandate from Vatican Congregation for Catholic Education. Every follower of Christ, by reason of his human life and Christian vocation, is called to live dialogue in his daily life. Whether he finds himself in a majority situation or in that of a minority. This dialogue is a manner of acting, an attitude and a spirit which guides one's conduct. It implies concern, respect and hospitality towards the other. It leaves room for the other person's identity, his modes of expression and his values. Next slide. Here we see Jesus surrounded by all the symbols of the, all the major world religious traditions. Catholic Church re upholds, respects and promotes whatever that is good and holy in other religious traditions. Our institute has this motto, Isha Bhakti Paratnyanam, devotion to the Lord is the supreme wisdom. And our vision is a living temple of wisdom. Our institute is called Dharmaram Vidya Chetam. The Dharma of Jesus Christ for the well-being of all and the glory of God. We have many centers to show that our action, our studies are not restricted to Catholic theology or the Bible. In fact, our curriculum includes on all the world religious traditions. We study Sanskrit, Hinduism in detail, Buddhism, Jainism, Sikhism and Islam. We have four journals, Journal of Dharma, Asian Horizons, Vinaya Sadhana and Justicia promoting this dialogue. And we have once again the wheel of Dharma presented on at the entrance to our Vidya Chetra. I represent the Center for Study of World Religions. It serves as a forum for the exchange of ideas and experiences regarding approaches and methods to the problems related to the religious quest of humanity. We have realized in the 21st century, no one religion is going to be the only religion. We also realized that there will be religions. Whatever be the promotions, there is the religions are going to stay. So the only model is dialogue and living in harmony. It promotes common action for justice and development for the marginalized. We have a special program. We call it FIRE. I would like to uh, say religion is FIRE. It can be used or abused. It's very powerful. It's an acronym for Fellowship in Religious Experience. We take our students. We usually take to Sri Sri Devi Sangha's place, Brahma Gumari's place, Iskon, Buddhist Vihara, Sikh Temple, and uh, Islamic Mosque. It is a unique feature of our training program, visiting sacred places of all the six traditions and share in the religious and social life of believers monks and nuns, share meals, observe rituals and participate in festivals of these religious and cultural centers. Next slide. And that's the last one. Next slide, please. We have in, on the main altar, it would be very difficult for you to see in any other worshipping place. This is the Catholic seminary, largest in India. This year we had 56 new priests after the training. But on the main altar, you have the symbols of all world religions. The motto or the vision is, wherever there is truth and holiness, it is from God. So you see the symbol of the Tao giving the universality of the spirit. And we have Jesus Christ standing on the lotus flower. Next slide, please on the lotus flower following the Indian tradition and 
holding all that we have achieved, all the symbols of the civilization, the wheel, the book, the uh, sapling, and all humanity, six young men, young men and women, representing the whole of humanity, and Jesus offering everything to God the Father. God is the source, God is the sustainer, and God is the goal. Let's bring God back into our dialogue. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jose, for bringing God back into action. We have Dr. Sonal Ambani. Dr. Sonal Wimble Ambani has devoted her life to charity and non-profit initiatives. She is the founder of the World Peace 2012-2040. The World Peace 2040 is a disciplined, time-bound action plan towards achieving 365 days of world peace by the end of the year 2040. Let us all see what she has to say. I, I, I'd like you to turn to the other side and give the person on the other side of you a big hug. Find someone else. Okay. All right. So, uh, thank you. So that's going to be the beginning of the hug that goes around the world. So thank you. Um, I'll just... Uh, Thank you. I hope you were able to at least read the subtitles, if not uh, hear the, uh, what we're trying to do. Um, Einstein said that insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. I think for world peace, we've never put a de time frame or deadline to it. But I feel if we put a deadline, we ask for just one day, a month of peace, uh, we can make a change in the world. Uh, Jeffrey Sachs has written a book, The End of Poverty, and he says every, we're looking for money, but we're saying if we can take just even 1% of that multi-trillion dollar defense budget, 
we can put it back into the economy and solve things like poverty alleviation. Um, I think we all know the statistics, but 800 million people go to bed hungry every day, and of that, the majority are children. The next slide. Um, for me, this one picture says it all. How can we possibly be here today in the year 2011 and accept that even one child in the world can be like that with legs as uh, thin as twigs, uh, with a vulture waiting to devour him, waiting for him to die? I mean, there's something wrong we, with us where we are today. We, we have to change it. We just have to. It's not acceptable. So how do we go about changing this cycle? What is the solution? I, I think the members on the panel have already gone about it. But what we feel is that through education in the schools, we can do this. Um, our thought is to have, on that one day of peace a month, is ask school children around the world to wear a piece of clothing that's white, whether it be a handkerchief, a white t-shirt, um, you know, a white uniform, anything, white, a white cap. Uh, we feel that we need a thread, a common thread throughout the world that binds everyone, whether you're in Germany, in the Middle East, in America, and says, look, on this day, we're all going to think about peace, talk about peace. Um, I'm working with two organizations, the Peace, or, uh, the peace Dragon, and another one where we're going to have Monday mediation days. So every Monday, when school children come to school, um, the teacher is going to bring up, you know, okay, do you have, what, what can I do? Are, is there anyone you're fighting with? Or what Maya said yesterday, like her son said, no, I'm not inviting this girl because she's from a different religion than mine. But if that came out in every Monday and said, look, she's different, and then the teacher addressed it or the students themselves talked about it, there, we can make a change. If every Monday children can talk about it, and even we'd like to take that white outfit, you know, uh, out into the workplace also, like you mentioned, maybe BMW is part of it, but actually getting, you know, corporate citizens around the world too, maybe even that like, simple thing as a white handkerchief, but shows that yes, I agree to a peace day, and for my leaders today to agree to a ceasefire on that day. Uh, and a another way to achieve this, which we thought is through sports, and of course sports brings about, you know, it, it, it's a... Um, equalizer in terms of, uh, you know, it doesn't matter what culture, what religion you are when you're playing a game of football, the idea is just to get the ball in the goal. So again, if that one day a month we can have uh, sports, football matches, cricket matches, basketball matches, uh, again around the world with school children from around the world, it's another way for them to know, okay, today's a peace day and today we're going to play sports and we're going to have peace. So where are we today uh, in terms of our project? We'd like to work together with you. We have a website created uh, to have people sign up from around the world. Um, we've got emails going on to world leaders. Uh, we'd l our objective, of course, is to present this uh, to the United Nations. Um, I think in the alliance in the presentation given, it's like we're looking for deliverables. So we want a deliverable. We need to do something. We need to actually take, put an action plan into, spa into pace, place. Next slide. Uh, so what are we going to do? We've got a, a coffee table book that's um, being made of all the world leaders and asking them what, what do they feel about peace and to show the world that, look, everybody wants peace. Um, the most prominent person we already have in the book is the President, Yu Jintao, the President of China, uh, who's agreed to be in the book. Um, we've got a great board of advisors, uh, the most notable being Nobel Laureate Muhammad Yunus, uh, the founder of Grameen Bank, who's behind us and a very well-spoken man. Next. So how can we work together and how can you in the audience and us actually put an action plan together? We'd like your help with connecting to world leaders, uh, your help of course in getting this resolution passed. Uh, if you can help us make it a massive movement, I was actually in Cairo last week on day two, three, four, five of, uh, of the uprising and um, it was, you know, actually seeing it live, seeing what a mass movement can be done. Uh, it's created on Facebook, on Twitter, uh, telling people to come out. So if we can do the same thing for peace you know, asking everyone to come out that day. What we're trying to do is on the 1st of September, I think the next slide, please. Uh, uh, the 1st of September, have a rally around the world where everyone comes out and says, okay, tell your president, your prime minister to actually come out and support a UN resolution to support one day of, of peace in the year 2012. Next. I think like a rainbow, we can all make it happen with the United Nations and universe, uh, unity or harmony, as we've been talking, in diversity, we can make it a more beautiful world. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you Sonal. I just wish you were here when you said, give a hug to the person who's immediately here. <laughs> Do it now. <laughs> Thank you. Next, we have uh, 
Sri Priyanga Kumara Premaratni, the Chairman and Executive Director of Proceeds Consultants, that stands for promoting social, economic, and environment sustainability in Sri Lanka. He is a researcher, disaster risk manager, and a socio-economic and environmental program developer with orientation of community and grassroots level. Educationally qualified with national and international expo exposure on related areas, he always promotes, promotes sustainable approaches through practical and realistic strategies. Here you go. Wishing, wishing you a, a very happy day and a very successful day. Uh, I uh, thank you for the organizers uh, for giving me this opportunity. Uh, I think uh, if I uh, was a participant before 2009, uh, I am a citizen of a war-affected country, but uh, today I am a proud uh, citizen of a peaceful and uh, free of uh, living country uh, in the world. Uh, most recently, uh, Sri Lanka is the uh, best achiever in uh, peace development uh, because in Sri Lanka there was, uh, uh, it is also like our neighboring a neighbor country, India, uh, we have uh, diversity in uh, religions as well as the uh, languages and ethnicities. Uh, for uh, uh, centuries, we have a mutual understanding and uh, coexistence among each other, uh, but uh, due to some uh, minor and very uh, 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 shortages, very limited shortages uh, taken by uh, uh, previous leaders, like uh, in both sides, uh, the issue has developed into a uh, world famous and uh, most uh, destructive uh, battle in the country. Now uh, all the ethnicities in the country as a one Sri Lankan nation, uh, we are proud of our freedom in the country. Now. Uh, the government and all the other parties are developing the country uh, because now we have uh, another battle for uh, gaining that is uh, battling for uh, the development and uh, eradicating the poverty and uh, the other uh, related issues like uh, health issues and uh, disaster related issues we have a lot of thing challenges to be gained uh, <coughs> Uh, related to uh, my uh, participation uh, in this uh, program is uh, mainly uh, concerned on the sustainable uh, uh, improvements in uh, social and economic uh, concerns related to the uh, war affected and after the uh, war, the Sri Lankan uh, situation can be, how we can improve the Sri Lankan situation uh, in some, extent, uh, some uh, areas. Because uh, Though the government and other international and other supporters are doing the development part, basically in infrastructure and physical development, uh, in, uh, in a balanced and a well, uh, uh, me, uh, well uh, distributive way, uh, there are some lackings, mainly in uh, uh, developing the uh, coordinations, cooperations among the people, because Though uh, we are having a diversity in languages and religions and uh, in other uh, cultural uh, differences, uh, there are some lackings of uh, uh, combining and linking uh, those uh, groups into uh, one forum, one understanding. Because uh, in the future, we are not expecting such uh, big uh, destructive uh, situations e even uh, not in the Sri Lanka but in the whole world uh, because we have uh, suffered enough uh, for during that uh, previous 29 uh, 30 years uh, with uh, drastic uh, damages to the economy social and uh, our uh, future generation also therefore uh, as a 
practitioner in Sri Lanka, I think uh, most important uh, thing we have to do in uh, related to the Sri Lanka is because uh, Sri Lanka can be taken as a uh, case, successful case uh, related to the international other uh, uh, problem solving and uh, conflict solving uh, situations because uh, the people as well as the uh, governments and other uh, parties have a lot of experiences related to uh, the war, uh, war affected areas and peace development and uh, because they have uh, suffered in different ways and they have different uh, develop different strategies uh, related to uh, how to uh, uh, improve the peaceful, uh, harmonious uh, society. In uh, that way, I think uh, grabbing those experiences from the uh, grassroots level to the planning level is very uh, vital. Because uh, uh, in other uh, way, I think uh, improvement of the uh, language among all the uh, parties, like uh, in Sri Lanka, Sinhalese, uh, is the majority and they uh, majority of them are not uh, using or uh, are familiar with the Tamil and uh, Tamil people are not uh, well familiar with the singles. Uh, for example, I have experienced a lot of uh, situations because uh, many situations because I am a frequent traveler of uh, trains in uh, Sri Lanka. Uh, though all the uh, community all all type of uh, people are traveling by the same train, uh, they are not having uh, good communications because they have feelings uh, and like uh, uh, they may be having sweating uh, in the uh, hard times and they may have some uh, incompatibilities uh, due to uh, uh, not opening a window, but they communicate but not having a in detail. In very uh, limited communication is uh, available with these communities. Therefore, I think one best uh, sustainable solution is to improve the uh, language. Uh, uh, language uh, linkages, uh, st strong communication uh, strategies among the uh, communities because even it is applicable to the whole, whole world. Since we are having now uh, uh, the most of the communicational uh, strategies, technologies, like web-based or uh, multi, uh, multimedia approaches and uh, different publications we are having, different uh, teaching methodologies are applicable, uh, but still we are having the gap of uh, this uh, improvement of the languages among uh, at least uh, some communication level. I think uh, it is a good uh, solution. As a solution, I, uh, as a suggestion, I uh, forward to uh, all the audience here. And uh, as most of our uh, speakers uh, say, uh, we are not having a good uh, understanding of the religions, the principles of religions, because uh, most of the our. Uh, people, the majority of people are following a religion, any religion, but they are not, uh, sometimes some groups are not having a good uh, uh, understanding of others' faiths or others' beliefs, because all the religions are uh, remain for the sake of the good, good side, and uh, for the uh, uh, betterment of the people, not for the worse, for the uh, religion is not for, uh, not a, a tool for, uh, not a cause for the war. But uh, that misunderstanding is there. Therefore, I think uh, at least basic understanding among uh, the all the religious uh, groups, the main burden of that uh, is fallen on our religious leaders as well as uh, the educational uh, practice, practice, practitioners uh, because uh, and uh, policy makers. I think uh, that is my suggestion and uh, uh, I wish you all a, a happy and peaceful uh, uh, future. Thanks. Thank you Priyanka.
The last speaker for this noon is Professor Fethi Mansouri, holds a chair in Migration and Intercultural Research and is the Director of Centre for Citizenship and Globalisation at Deakin University, Australia. Welcome, Professor. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Now, for academics, it's extremely difficult to speak for three, five minutes. So I'll, I'll, I'll give you some food for thought. I think you've heard a lot of spiritual a lot of uh, discussions about certain aspects of the cultural, intercultural relations and, 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 and uh, problems, if you like. Let me throw in a few ideas that I would like you to think about uh, as, you, as you deliberate and perhaps work, work towards a more practical outcome. I think there's a lot of misdiagnosis of what goes on with regard to intercultural relations. Um, people are still talking about certain problems that the world is seeing and reading them as being a byproduct of cultural problems. And I can tell you they're far from it. It's not about culture. There are a lot of, if you look at uh, studies of racism and discrimination, a lot of the problems that we find is you can categorize and typologize about racism and discrimination. And you can see that some of it happens at the interpersonal level. Some of it happens at the intercultural uh, level, if you like. Predominantly, a lot of it happens at the institutional level. And that's where there's a huge failure. We have a failure of institutions, and I think we need to, we need to understand that. And I'll come back to that point very briefly. Uh, I would like you to think and reflect about on two key words that I'm, I'm going to be discussing. The first is intersectionality, and the second is cosmopolitanism. Why I'm using these two words, and I would like you to use them as a framework for understanding some of these debates. Intersectionality tells us that many things in our lives intersect. When we talk about racism and when we talk about intercultural problems, it's not only, uh, as I said, uh, an outcome of, of culture. It is also an outcome of socioeconomic background. It is an outcome of educational levels. It is an outcome of geography. It is an outcome of history. And it is an outcome of failure of international uh, regimes within which we operate. So we need to understand that if there's no binary of features, it's not a black and white. It's not poverty and richness. It's not less developed than more development. So we need to understand that lots of issues intersect and create hugely complex phenomena that unfortunately are still being misread and misunderstood and therefore misdiagnosed, which makes coming up with solutions a little bit more tricky. The other thing that I would like you to think about is the notion of cosmopolitanism. We've heard here today that many people talk about peace, harmony, understanding, uh, law, lack of law, international frameworks, international organizations, but there is a big problem with these institutions. So let me give you an example. The 1951 Refugee Conventions says, among other things, that every single human being has a right to seek refuge for fear, when, when they have a fear of persecution due to race, religion, etc., etc. The same international framework does not compel signatory states to actually offer refuge to refugees. So we have a huge problem here. We have one set of laws which allow me, someone of Tunisian background, to actually be able to seek refuge if I want to, say in, say in France. But the same international regime does not provide the framework, the normative framework, for a state like France or Germany or Australia to be in a position where it is compelled to actually offer me refuge and protection. Now that gap, that gap, is what makes our job extremely difficult. We cannot force some of these fantastic aspirational goals that we have here, goals of understanding, peace, harmony. We cannot affect them unless there is an institutional normative framework through which we can make institutions, organizations bound by a minimum, if you like, a minimum framework through which they have to, they have to operate. And therefore, that brings me back to... Uh, to what I think should happen. So we can theorize, we can talk about the problems, if you like, the theoretically and academically speaking. But what can happen is we have witnessed a new thing called people power that's taking place. And I was in Tunisia too when the Tunisian uprising started. And I was in Egypt before the Egyptian uprising started. What we are seeing right now is through, and I like uh, uh, Jean-Christophe's uh, earlier talk about the uh, new media and its, its importance. What we are witnessing now is there's new people power, powered, if you like, by the new technology, which is enabling people to bypass the state. So people are actually connecting. They're building 
uh, agendas of solidarity, agendas of, of, of understanding. And that agenda is putting a huge amount of pressure on centralized, uh, I must even, I can even add, uh, illegitimate uh, states in many parts of the world. And it's through that people power that we're able now to seek some meaningful change. Uh, so that is something that's already happening. The, the other thing that I will, would like to think about a little bit more constructively is the notion of civil society. We've heard a lot of talk about civil society. Civil society is basically any organization, any NGO, faith-based organization or otherwise, that is operating within public space to create the buffer, the security buffer, between the state and the individuals. We really have not done enough with civil society. We have not understood that civil society is another source of authority and power that can minimize the impact of absolutist states, states who do not respect the human rights, that can be cultivated in a way that is quite uh, organized and in a way that can produce certain outcomes. So I go back to what I heard earlier about the clash of civilizations thesis. There's no clash of civilization as such, I can assure you of that. Uh, end of history, Fukuyama's uh, famous thesis, there's no end of history. The West has not really won the part of organizations, but who are able to put pressure on the state and influence the state in a way that could bring about change. As I said, academics will talk too much, so he's telling me to stop, so I better stop. I could talk for an hour, but thank you very much. Thank you, Professor. The, the aim to keep the presentations as short as possible is to engage in an audience participation. So now we leave the floor open, and the audience is encouraged to ask specific questions to if you wish to have a general question or to specific members on the dais. So, but make yourself very clear on what you want to do. Do we have a mic in? Okay. Don't take more time. Don't worry. <laughs> I'm Dr. Venugopal Reddy. I'm a physician and a life skills coach from USA. I belong to Tuvandrum. I'm here on an extended vacation. My comments, I would like to make a few comments based on Mr. Korakwala's presentation. He uh, cited seven values, gratitude, forgiveness, love, humility, patience, giving, and truth. And unfortunately, that is a tolerance, that is a value which is missing in this list. And numerous studies and research have shown that tolerance is absolutely essential for maintaining harmony and preserving our harmony. It is a sad truth and an ugly fact that most of the conflicts that are there between religions, between cultures, between political institutions, they are initiated, sustained, and aggravated by lack of tolerance. So we must, we must invest a lot of our time and energy in teaching and practicing tolerance if we want to achieve that motto, unity in diversity. Thank you. Yeah, please. Uh, the, you want to take the So actually you are very correct. Uh, the tolerance is a very important value. And in our teaching, when we teach the Tena course on the seven human values, the value of tolerance comes as part of the value of love. So in love you do sharing, caring, then you respect others, and it also includes a part of tolerance. So it's covered in the love part. Also, I think patience is one of the values where uh, tolerance could be covered in a certain area. Uh, patience is at a level, in the love part, the tolerance comes, and it is included in that value. Uh, I am Krishan Khanna. Uh, my question is really to uh, any of the panelists. It was uh, about three years ago, I was at an uh, international uh, seminar in uh, San Antonio in the USA. And uh, this was on education. And I was the only Indian, I think, in that uh, gathering of 300 people. And we had the uh, Secretary of Education who, uh, who had flown down at the, uh, uh, to the venue as the chief guest. And this is the question I asked him, and I want to share it with you. And maybe you can answer. After the Second World War, 
the most powerful nations of the world have been very busy exporting armaments and ammunition to the third world whether it is africa whether it is middle east uh, whether it is asia or latin america don't you think the world today would have been different if they had exported education and not ammunition that's the question any specific whom do you want uh, to direct the question at swami ji would you like to take the question the answer is there in the question itself so of course when education is imparted and value based education that solves all the problems so i very i think i'm sure everyone will totally agree to um, his idea that uh, instead of arms and ammunition we should be uh, imparting education and faith and culture and all that i think dr jose wants to share his thoughts i wholeheartedly agree with you sir education is the key to the development there are three misplaced trust in the modern society i would even call them as superstitions one the power of money second one the power and faith in science and technology these are misplaced trusts we thought science would liberate us from all the wars and all the problems and all the superstitions and the third one is the media in the earlier discussion said one priest or one someone a pastor said we are going to burn the quran we have uh, learning about islam last 26 i spoke to the muslims but that will not come to the media so these three powers money science and technology and the media they are necessary but not sufficient for harmony of life and our misplaced trust on them destroys humanity thank you dr jose i think what we require now is it we all know it that is information technology but along with that inner transformation and it.com clarity of mind forgiveness is a very important quality and uh, in la- in daily life we are faced with many situations where we have a choice either to forgive or to react with a revenge with anger or something it's like a table tennis match if somebody gets angry you can get angry back and the match can go on forever so the real thing of the thing is when someone gets angry is it possible to drop your pride and ego and uh, be humble enough and stop the match catch the ball instead of hitting the ball back and uh, it's a difficult thing in real life but if you do that uh, because lot of our tension in our relationship happen because of uh, anger going back forth back and forth with anger and you are not able to forgive so forgiveness is a most important and fundamental quality for inner human peace and uh, today at gokhat foundation we have announced the uh, the world forgiveness day and uh, 25000 ribbons have been uh, circulated in the colleges of mumbai and people will tie the forgiveness ribbon on others and ask for forgiveness so this is a small way in how we can try to create a more forgiving world because forgiveness is the path to happiness and it is the path to creating a more loving world which is uh, one of our own aim which we are trying to do yeah. i just want to say something we have to be very careful here on, in, in this forum and in a lot of uh, conferences and suppose at that time we have to be very careful that we do not become very prescriptive about these things uh, there is diversity in this audience there is diversity in people who believe or don't believe they don't follow religions uh, we have to be extremely difficult that while certain values might be very powerful in certain culture specific environments they may well not be as powerful in different environments and therefore its articulation or the articulation of those values has to be framed in a language that's as 
I'm sorry to use this language, as neutral, culturally speaking, as it can be, uh, so that it can attain a certain universalist dimension. Uh, otherwise, I think we will be sitting here talking to our own selves. You know, we're having a monologue, not a dialogue. I think that's extremely dangerous that people, whether they're from India and Kerala, whether they're from Eastern Africa, the Horn of Africa, whether they're from Asia, there are certain things that unite us, locally speaking, but the articulations of those are human values, they take different shapes and forms, and we need to be extremely mindful of that. And that's why forgiveness and tolerance, it may well be dressed in different language if you go and, and talk to the uh, Tunisian writers who now definitely want to bring about the former regime and, and all the associates to be, to be, you know, to be uh, responsible for all, for, for all they did. And they believe in the rule of law now. For them, the rule of law comes before any other value that, that might aspire to have here. So just saying it's not culture relativism, if you like, but it's a, an awareness of culture specificities that we really have to be able to take into, into consideration when we're articulating things. I thank you for your thought and I think you are very right uh, because uh, if spirituality comes into religion then it will not be accepted by different things. But spirituality in itself uh, relates only to the humanity and it uh, relates to all religions and it's as a human quality. So when we talk of forgiveness, we talk of forgiveness at a human level and not uh, pertaining to any culture or any religion. Uh, these are simple uh, emotions and qualities which are uh, at a human level. And it applies to all human examples in everyday life. And uh, in my book, Seven Human Values, uh, all these seven human values have been taken, uh, like Hinduism, Christianity, Islam, Buddhism, and all the different cultures and philosophies have been taken. And how all these religions, and uh, they propose these seven human values. And that's what the trying to promote these seven human values through that. Any more questions? Yeah, you have. One, yeah. One question. The question relates to education again. Uh, any panelist may wish to answer this. Uh, when we talk about educational institutions, since we speak about the youth, there are educational institutions run by religious groups also, and I'm talking India specific. Uh, when a liberal leader takes charge of certain institute, and I think I'm looking more at Professor Mansuri because you're an academician, uh, and the students revolt against a liberal leader who has taken charge of such an institution. There is a dilemma. So how does one resolve that? And I think I specifically speak about uh, uh, the Darul Ulema where uh, uh, the leader, Mr. Bastani, has taken charge and which has created a bit of a furore in relation to development. So um, if a light could be shed by any of the panelists. Thank you. It's a very pertinent question, and I'll tell you why. Because uh, we, we, we're talking about uh, societies where uh, religion might or might not have a very prominent role. You know, we have secular societies, we have less secular societies. We have the French model of totally separating the state from religious education in general. Um, let me tell you about France specifically, with which I'm very familiar, and I'm having grown up in Tunisia, uh, and in Tunisia too, for that matter, which followed the French model. The state in France, at some stage, has actually wanted, wanted to separate uh, education from any religious interference. You know? um, I was in France last year doing some research, um, funded by Australia, but comparative looking at England, uh, the UK, Canada, and France, looking at the notion of intercultural relations and how it plays out locally. And I was surprised to find that in France, for instance, even though we think it's a very laic society, that 20% of the education system is actually goes through Catholic schools, and that Catholic schools do receive funding from governments. There's another thing that France did which was very controversial. At the height of 9, following 9-11, and um, France has a significant population of North African origins, the, Maghreb, the Maghrebis who are uh, from, from former colonies. As a way of trying to control education in religious schools, if you like, and also to regulate uh, mosques and sermons and preachers, they tried to control who leads prayers, for instance, who leads Islamic schools and they tried to engage in a system of sponsoring certain moderate religious leaders to come and teach. It backfired because some of the people who were coming out of uh, 
France in particular, were actually even more uh, intolerant. I go back to your to your uh, to your notion. So I think education is extremely important, but we have to be very very careful how the state plays with education. Uh, in Australia, we're very lucky. This is where I am right now. I've been there for 20 years. In Australia, we're very lucky that we have a system whereby we introduced some values, some notions of multicultural education, for instance, whereby we focus on civics, civics as the key framework within which we try to bring about the next generation of citizenry. I think that's working. Very, it's not perfect. It's not ideal, but it's working very well in bringing about a generation of Australians who have a commitment towards a certain uh, national, if you like, uh, framework with values and civic expectations and duties that people play out publicly, knowing that we have a framework that is inclusive and, and not very, uh, not, not, not very, uh, if you like, favoring certain religious denominations over others. But the problems are still there. And I think education is extremely important as a vehicle for this, for this, uh, for this agenda. That aspect of it related to India, how does, because it was the students who didn't want or don't want, or so it is reported in the media, I go back to the responsibility of the media also because we believe what we are reading. So I'm not quite sure any of the panelists may wish to answer that, but perhaps this question could be taken to the focus group, uh, which is in the afternoon, and a little deliberation might bring about some interesting facts where India is concerned. Sure. Maybe uh, at some point in time you can you may want to talk to Swamiji on, on a one-to-one -one basis and, and find out if he has some thoughts on that area specifically. Because I'm not very sure would he, whether you would have an answer now, but if we could think about it uh, at our end and then get back to them with an answer. Thank so you. shall we move on to the next? The way I see it is the, the relationship between religion and spirituality. Religion comes from the Latin rally go, ligament, I tie you, I bind you. And somebody in a religion is bound by dogmas, practices, thoughts, and all that. I think religion should then lead us to spirituality. And in the age of Aquarius that we are talking about, they say that organized religion is likely to become less a dominant feature where we will be freed from these bonds and rise into spirituality. That's the relationship as I see it. Yeah, members from, from that, I think we should, we should move back and oh, yeah. get an opportunity to, yeah, it's become too much of we here. Let's, let's move a little back. Yeah, if you could have you standing up. Hi, yes. I'll just stand up here so you can see me. Um, my name is Lisa and I'm from the Diversity Council Australia, and I wrote this down so I thought I'd forget it. Now, a lot, a lot of people have been speaking about religion, and it is an identifier and an important identifier for many people, but it's not the only identifier. I work in the broad area of diversity where people identify in other categories like gender, their sexuality or the orientation, their ability or their disability, their social and economic status. How do we create unity and harmony when there are sometimes conflicting agendas or conflicting um, ideals between religious doctrine and the goals of gender organisations or other types of diverse organisations? Okay, so I think it's a very pertinent question because when in this mo world which we live in, which always is there, uh, there will always exist multiple uh, thoughts. People have different viewpoints, thoughts, beliefs, values, everything is, some of it will be conflicting, some of it will be common. So how do we deal with the conflicting viewpoints? Uh, that's your question. Uh, here, the uh, theoretical perspective that uh, we are all equal as human beings, number one. Uh, number two, our thing is to live and let live. And number three, uh, we are equal as human beings. So we are not to pass judgment on someone else. Uh, if we have a concept, there's a power of nature or power of creator or uh, someone else is judging. In Hindu philosophy, it's called law of karma. In Christianity, it's God. In Islam, it's another concept. But whatever that superior power, that power is there to pass a judgment on the other people. So we are not here to pass judgment whether she's right or he's right. And let them live with their own beliefs and you live with your beliefs. So you are accountable only for your beliefs and not for someone else's belief. So this theory that they're the justice someone else is doing, 
you are not the person to do the justice and to create justice in the world and change people's belief through force and through violence and anger. Uh, this is a central thought that can be propagated to create the live and let live concept. I have another thought coming in from here. Yes, Priyanka. Uh, regard, uh, uh, regarding uh, your uh, uh, questions, uh, I think uh, uh, the, uh, we have some uh, controversial, controversial uh, situations uh, uh, when uh, we are uh, going to match uh, the different uh, uh, doctrines into uh, one form. But I think uh, at that time, we have to <coughs> be much careful, on, uh, that's why we should uh, uh, identify the more standardized uh, educational uh, modules uh, related to uh, the religious and uh, some those uh, different uh, disciplines uh, into uh, uh, for uh, developing the peace. Because uh, unless that will be uh, another <coughs> uh, tragedy uh, with uh, those uh, uh, arguments and uh, those conflicts. Uh, the diversity should be there, but uh, we can uh, extract the uh, most uh, related. That uh, because um, all the uh, all the religions have the uh, thoughts and uh, visions uh, which are which can be acceptable by uh, as a common general. Those can be promoted uh, to uh, develop the peace, but uh, the specific concept in the religions uh, to be followed by the uh, that uh, specific uh, religious followers. Then uh, that conflict can be uh, avoided uh, because uh, the diversity makes the beauty of the world. Therefore, we should respect that diversity, keeping uh, the interconnections and relations uh, using those uh, common thoughts. I think uh, that's the good solution. I think I, I understood what uh, Anna was, was trying to say there. It takes me back to the point I was making earlier. We do have some frameworks that should be able to deal with that kind of situation where you've got more than just one issue being at play. And we have international human rights frameworks. We have the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Again, that should cover instances whereby you've got problems, say, with sexuality, with you know, sexual orientations or religious orientations or what have you. The problem we have is those, those international frameworks we have, they don't have enough room for them. We, we're, not, we're not really in a position to come to a state and say, look, you're in violation of this specific person's rights, and therefore we will come from outside, despite your sovereignty, and we will make you pay for whatever crimes you've committed against a specific minority. Or, and there's a lot of minority problems across the world, uh, be they indigenous uh, people or uh, minorities as, 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 a, as a result of migration. So again, I think we go back to the normative challenge that we have. We have frameworks, but they're not powerful enough to provide in cases where there's an overlap of certain problems that would produce a complex case where it's not just about one specific issue. Uh, How many students do we have in here? If I could have some students raise their hands. Do we have students in here? Yeah, if we could have a couple of questions coming in from students, the youth of of tomorrow. Yeah, we have some. Again, we are all young here. <laughs> okay, students who are going through formal education. Hello everyone, I am a student from Samasat University, Thailand. Okay. I am Melody Chu Tong from Thailand. We are representing uh, students from Thailand. Okay, okay, all right. Uh, as we are youth, right? So this is actually this is my first time to join this forum. Like at first, I I, I feel like do I too young to this forum because everybody are working. But I think the youth is so important for our our social. Like if you guys are working and you don't care about us, like. You, you, okay, your work is done in your, gener in your generation. And what about the, on the future? You have to, to reveal, to, to reveal your point, your imagination, your, your goal to, to us. So that's why I saw this forum, so I can learn more. Like, so, and, and as, as I'm, we are 
my youth. So how can you teach us? How can you train for next generation of humans for building the peace uh, to 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 our global to our world? So. Sonan, would you like to take this? The question is, how are you going to help us, the youth, to, to help build peace? And I think Sonal is doing something in that area, so let's listen to her now. Right, a very good question. Um, I think when she said we need to build it from a very young age, as, as young as a five-year-old in school, uh, you know, learning to negotiate, to talk to other children, to try to... Uh, work out their differences on their own, with a teacher or even without a teacher, if students from a very young age, and even I guess at your age as teenagers, um, you know, I'm sure you've seen the movie Mean Girls, have you seen that yet? Can really, so, um, you know, like that, there has to be dialogue uh, between yourselves and trying to understand, and maybe we thought if we could get it one day a week of maybe trying, if from a young age you start that dialogue with each other, then you know, okay, you know, every month, Monday, let, let's just talk it out, you know, we're within a classroom of maybe 30 children, uh, you know, if anyone has any issues or any, any points of contention, let's let's talk, let's discuss it, and let's try to resolve, let's resolve the situation before it gets further, because I think it's very good what you said about the ping pong ball, that anger just goes back and forth, at some point you have to catch that ball and stop the anger, else it keeps festering, you know, until it's a, a, a wound that cannot be healed, so we've got to stop it uh, beforehand. So we'd like that. We'd like to join the project, worldpeace2040.com, if I can plug it. You know, go on, give us, one, your signature of support. Second is, we have a link to the President or Prime Minister of Thailand, and tell him, support World Peace 2040. So if, if enough of the youth around the world go onto the website and tell, there's a direct link for all 192 countries, and tell their President or Prime Minister, support this project, agree to one day of peace, maybe we can actually make it happen. You guys can be the revolution of world to make peace happen one day a month if Thailand agrees. And like that, we get countries from around the world to agree. Just, you know, so let's start with one day of peace a month and, and go from there. And make sure we have this conference in Thailand where president comes down 2012. Uh, there are two examples. One is uh, the Art of Living Foundation is doing a lot of work with the youth and of course the Bokart Foundation also. So one quick example from each one of you. Yeah, actually this question is asked at a very appropriate time because just uh, 15 days back we have launched a 10-hour module it's called Inspirate Scandal and this is meant for corporates and colleges. So in the colleges uh, the students go through this 10-hour course and it's called Inspirate Scandal and it is on these seven human values and there are inspirational videos, there's an alumni or the faculty <coughs> who teaches and then after the 10-hour course there's an online test and we are, then we test the student and so it's basically on the concept of these seven values. And uh, this is how we... Would you like to, to speak about the Inspiration Club that you were mentioning sometime And back? we also have Inspiration Club in colleges. We are having 12 Inspiration Club in 12 colleges, where the students uh, come for three purposes. For human values, social awakening and social development. And we engage with the students in this respect. So the next Inspiration Club can be a Thailand at your university. Let us hear from Swamiji now. And uh, Art of Link Foundation, we conduct this program called YES, that is Youth Empowerment Seminar, this is happening all over the world. And also we conduct the YLTP, Youth Leadership Training Program. You know the problem with the youth is, everyone says, no one understands me, the world is not understanding me. Actually it should be like, I am not expressing it correctly. So through these programs, we improve three things, that is perception, observation and expression. And this is creating a huge wave all over the world and uh, we encourage more and more youth to join this. So empowerment, empowerment is the key. So we'll have final two questions before we head for lunch. The two could, yes, here you go. Well, we have many. I was just trying to check if there is a demand. <laughs> I think uh, we would inculcate in childhood itself the how to respect other religion, then about the uh, respecting uh, other culture. You have to start from childhood. Community itself. living. Yeah, I, I remember when I used itself. to be in school, there used to be a subject called community living which no longer exists. Yeah, yeah. Now in, in curriculum also, in primary, even we can start from pre-primary <coughs> education curriculum, then primary of course. That's very important in childhood. Science. Then very basic. Moral science. Yeah, yeah. There is no moral science nowadays. So that's very important. I think the respect for this. 
if Gandhi is asked by read from some books that every day prayers will be connected from the Holy Quran, Bible and Bhavad Gita. Similarly, in one ashram here in Parkala, Sri Narayana Guru, uh, every day the, the, the day begins with prayers from Bible, Quran and Gita. Every day they are uh, doing that. So, communal harmony is there, religious harmony is there. The people who are coming there, we see that all the scriptures from all region is um, read there. That's very important. Such a way we can uh, inculcate habit among the from child, children. Thank you. In fact, there are such many such examples existing. Uh, if I can request the conference committee to maybe get in touch with the gentleman and, and put in record of such live examples that are existing, Excuse so we can then me. take it up with them. Uh, I'm just a professor in psychology and a professor of education together. I have been listening all together the whole discussion all along. I just want to post one, two, three things here. The first thing is that in terms of psychology, every individual is totally different. Please understand that, number one. Number two, when you come to yourself, yourself has got an inner world and the others outside you has got an outer world. To cross between the inner world and the outer world, it's not too easy for you. Number three, habits. One of the persons you are talking about habits. It's very interesting. If you remove the letter H, a bit is there. If you remove the letter A, a bit is there. If you remove the, the B, it is there. It. So any person who, who is habituated to live upon on a particular character or any type of behavior, I am a behavior consultant for information. It's very difficult to change his behavior in terms of our requirement. So it takes time, it takes job, it takes a lot of effort. And so whatever we have been discussing here, here is what he said. Understanding the self is more important before we talk anything about any personality. And of course, Swamiji is there. I have taken the course of this art of living 10 years back when Sri Sri has been here for the first time in Sri And I am one of his disciples in that way. And what I am talking about is that being a psychologist, I have been developing a power for the memory, empowering it, and I have been just finished out a book on memory banking, what I'm coming to the point of not posting what I'm saying. It's very difficult to talk on these types of psychological factors and behaviors and get a solution out of it within one session. So we have to think a lot. Thinking, think, go on thinking like this. And especially for the unity of diversity and bringing cultures together being a sociologist also, I'm taking, I'm a social psychologist, it's very difficult to bring all these things together. So please, make a big, bigger mind and have an open thinking and openness is the only answer for this. Thank you. Friends, one more question. Please be brief. We are behind schedule. Chair, I, think you I will be there. Wait, no, it's not a question, actually. I, I, I like guest from Thailand mentioned that. And I think once again, it's good to hear the voice of the, the young generation in this debate. Um, and what I'd like to really to emphasize at this point is, is um, there's not, need, not much need to reinvent the wheel and to come up with very, very sophisticated concepts. And I think what is really important and what really requires a very strong advocacy from people, from organization, to make a case for more systematic scholarship, fellowship program, exchange program, give any opportunity for people and particularly for young people to have a chance to travel, to meet 
uh, to hear, to talk with, with each other. And I think uh, your initiative, Father, that I mean, I'm very intrigued about it, is FIRE. I would be extremely interested myself, you know, to take this fellowship and to, you know, to have a chance in just a couple of days to understand and to have a better understanding of the different religions. This is the way we can learn and accept the difference and respect the difference even so. The idea is not to change our mind and to change our faith, but it is just to know that there's a difference, to respect this difference and, and, and to get a sense of this difference. And I'd like to just to take one example which has been a profound change in the, the mindset in, in Europe. Uh, you know, even so, Europe is a very integrated continent now, economically and financially, etc., etc. What has been really, really the turning point is when about 10 years ago, 15 years ago, uh, the EU has launched this massive program that is called Erasmus. Erasmus that gives a chance to almost all students uh, to go and spend six months or one year studying in another or two or three or other countries in Europe. And this has tremendously changed the way Europeans perceive each other. Because until a very recent time, there were still lots of stereotypes, lots of uh, uh, ideas about the other that were completely wrong. And this is really the most extraordinary integrating phenomenon, is really to give to young people uh, uh, better access to other cultures and other, and other people. And if that could be one of the outcomes of this forum, is really to to send a very strong call to governments to say, eventually, you have to dedicate uh, 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 some part of foreign aid or international cooperation to develop and to intensify and to massify uh, uh, a scholarship and an exchange program. This would be probably uh, what is uh, very important and, 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 and indispensable. And education at a very early age, giving chance to people to to know about the difference, you know, for instance, we have a launch, it's not that I want to promote the alliance, but this is an interesting example, for instance, <coughs> we have made a kind of a research of uh, um, education on religions and belief around the world. I mean, you still have many countries where uh, uh, children are given a chance just to learn about one religion which is in the the dominant religion in their own country, and there's not one word about other religions, which seems to be completely odd. And so we have been developing a kind of a toolkit of best practice on how to teach religion and belief in a way that uh, uh, gives an opportunity for children and for, uh, for students to, I mean, to have a, a, a wider horizon and to understand that the religion in the country where they live is not the religion of the whole world and that it's important to understand other religions, to respect them, to know the differences. Thank you. In fact, if the chairman could agree, there's one last question. We have a friend there in the blue attire. Seems to be a local, and I need to go back home safely. Uh, so. <laughs> friends, I represent an organization called Global Citizens for Sustainable Development. And uh, uh, my question is very simple. Uh, I want uh, the panelists who believe that youth is no more the future leader, but the present leader. <laughs> I'm so glad that it's well received, well attended, with a quality audience. This is what is required. And what has been created here, I understand the faces. Everyone wants to ask more and more questions, want to learn more and more. This shows we have eminent speakers, panelists, academics, 